Hello, it's Eric from Strong Medicine, and today I'm discussing complex regional pain syndrome. In extreme brief, this is a disorder of chronic pain, swelling, and vasomotor instability in one or more specific regions of the body, which involves regional dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, and which is usually triggered by surgery or some form of traumatic injury. Other names have been used for this syndrome in the past, most notably reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Let's talk about the clinical presentation. The universal symptom that all patients experience with CRPS is pain. It is most commonly localized to an arm or leg, but can occur in more than one limb and can affect other regions of the body, particularly in the setting of trauma. The pain is most frequently described as either a burning or stinging, it's usually felt deep inside rather than superficially, and tends to be more continuous rather than something that quickly comes and goes. But all patients are different. Patients experience hyperalgesia, which is an increased sensitivity to painful stimuli. For example, while having an IV placed is not pleasant for anyone, it can be unbearable to place an IV in an affected arm of a person with CRPS. Patients can also experience something called allodynia, which is when a person feels pain in response to stimuli not usually painful at all, such as an object lightly brushing against them or being sprayed with water. To better understand the difference between hyperalgesia and allodynia, consider this graph of pain intensity as a function of stimulus intensity, where the stimulus could be something like gradually increasing pressure applied by a needle. Normally, there is a range of very light stimulus that's detectable by a person before it's severe enough to cross the normal pain threshold and be experienced as painful. As the stimulus increases, at first the pain is barely noticeable, but reaches a point where it rapidly worsens, and then eventually, theoretically, starts to level off a little. Patients with CRPS have a similarly shaped curve, but it's shifted to the left. When the stimulus intensity is below that which causes pain in normal individuals, but high enough to cause pain in those with CRPS, that's allodynia. When the stimulus intensity is above the normal pain threshold, patients experience a relatively higher amount of pain intensity compared to normal, which is hyperalgesia. In addition to pain, there are many other symptoms which must, to some extent, be present in order for a patient to be diagnosed with CRPS. These other symptoms can include weakness in the affected extremity, tremor and myoclonic jerking, edema or swelling, skin color changes, which might be a modeling known as livido reticularis, a blue discoloration called cyanosis, or redness due to excessive blood flow referred to as hyperemia. The affected area can be unusually warm or cold to the touch and display excessive sweating. The skin can be atrophied, and in severe cases, there may even be joint contractures. Over time, some patients will experience patchy osteopenia or other bone changes visible on x-ray, MRI, or bone scan in the affected limb. Also over time, some patients will experience a spreading of the increased pain sensitivity to other parts of the body, though if that does occur, the non-pain symptoms usually remain present only in the initially affected region. Although it's not directly part of the syndrome, patients with CRPS can develop symptoms of depression and anxiety related to unremitting pain and the decrease in their overall quality of life. As mentioned before, about 90% of cases of CRPS have an identifiable trigger, which can be a fracture, surgery, crush injury, or sometimes something as seemingly unremarkable as a sprain. It's more common for CRPS to affect an arm than it is a leg, and the condition is more common in women. From a knowledge of these clinical features, how does a clinician make the diagnosis? The current standard for diagnosis is called the Budapest criteria. To satisfy the criteria, there must be persistent pain out of proportion to any inciting event, if there was one, and out of proportion to the normal healing process. There must be symptoms in at least three and physical signs at the time of examination in at least two of the following four categories. Sensory, meaning hyperesthesia or allodynia. Vasomotor, meaning asymmetric temperature and or regional changes to skin color. The edema and pseudomotor category, 
the latter of which means abnormal sweating, and the motor trophic category, which includes motor dysfunction and changes to hair, nails, or skin, aside from its color. And the last criteria is that the findings are not explained better by an alternative diagnosis. Bone scans, MRIs, and autonomic testing is sometimes used to better characterize the disorder in an individual patient, but the diagnosis is a clinical one and does not require any specific testing beyond the history and exam and whatever tests are deemed necessary to rule out alternative diagnoses. CRPS is sometimes subdivided into two types. In the more common type 1, there is not an identifiable injury to a specific peripheral nerve, whereas there is in type 2. For the most part, it doesn't matter which type a person has, at least as of now, the approach to treatment for both types is the same. When we discuss the differential diagnosis of CRPS, that is, diagnoses which can present similarly and which can cause a misdiagnosis, these include various infections, such as erysipelas, which is a skin infection of the upper dermis, peripheral vascular disease, a deep vein thrombosis, peripheral neuropathy from something like diabetes or a vitamin deficiency, though that would typically be bilateral and symmetric, radiculopathy, or pathology of a nerve root as it exits the spinal cord, Raynaud's phenomenon, which consists of attacks in which blood flow is temporarily interrupted to fingers and toes, resulting in changes in color, numbness, and or pain, and which can accompany autoimmune disease, a rare disease called erythromyalgia, which causes episodes of burning pain and redness in the hands and feet, and last, somatic symptom disorder, which is a form of psychiatric disease characterized by a person's extreme focus on a physical symptom that might then worsen the symptom itself in a positive feedback loop. Because many of CRPS's manifestations are subjective, distinguishing it from somatic symptom disorder can be especially challenging, and the two diagnoses are not mutually exclusive. Probably the most challenging aspect of diagnosing CRPS is the fact that it is usually triggered by surgery or injury, and the pain from CRPS is usually initially attributed to persistent pain from that original problem. After a person has broken an arm or had knee surgery, how long does the pain need to last for, and how severe does it need to be for it to raise a red flag to the treating clinician that something is not right? This is not just a broken bone or sprained ankle, something else is going on. Unfortunately, there, there is no specific duration of time that it takes for pain to resolve after trauma, which is responsible for a significant delay in the diagnosis of many cases of CRPS. Clinicians can make the mistake of attributing a patient's symptoms to psychological causes or just having a low pain threshold, even though having a low pain threshold is a very real physical phenomenon that is one of the hallmarks of the disease. And in many cases, a diagnosis is delayed because primary care physicians simply aren't sufficiently familiar with CRPS, hence its inclusion on this video series on underappreciated diseases. Where available, the management of CRPS is best done within a multidisciplinary pain management team with treatment consisting of adequate pain control, physiotherapy, and psychological therapy. Specific therapeutic options can be placed into three categories. The first is non-pharmacologic options, which includes education, physical and occupational therapy, and a referral to a psychologist who is experienced with treating patients with chronic pain. Regarding education, it's important for this to not just mean educating the patient themselves regarding CRPS, but also educating partners and family members. A common problem faced by patients with CRPS is having loved ones not understand the disease and underappreciate the severity of symptoms that patients may be experiencing. The second category is medications. These include non-steroidal anti-inflammatory meds like ibuprofen and naproxen, topical lidocaine, tricyclic antidepressants, gabapentin and pregabalin, muscle relaxants like baclofen, and bisphosphonates. In general, medications should be chosen based on which symptoms are the most severe. So if a patient is experiencing bad dystonia or muscle spasms, baclofen would be a logical medication to try. 
If muscle-specific symptoms are not prominent, then baclofen will be unlikely to be beneficial. Another medication class to consider is opiates. The use of opiates in any chronic pain disorder is controversial, and CRPS is no exception. Some experts argue that even excluding their addictive potential, chronic opiates can actually worsen long-term pain control in CRPS and should be avoided, if at all possible. However, they might have more of a role for the occasional relief of severe breakthrough pain. Infusions of ketamine, either as an outpatient or inpatient, is sometimes done for refractory pain. And the last category are invasive options, including a variety of sympathetic and perineural blocks, trigger point injections, and even spinal cord stimulators. While there are plenty of anecdotal stories of improvement with these invasive options, well-designed trials demonstrating benefit are currently lacking. The prognosis for patients with CRPS is highly variable and unpredictable. Some patients will experience full recovery over the span of months, some will have persistent but tolerable symptoms for years, and some will have debilitating disease, preventing work and regular physical activity indefinitely. It's generally believed that the earlier the diagnosis is made and treatment initiated, the higher the probability of a good long-term outcome. That concludes this very brief introduction to complex regional pain syndrome. If you found this to be interesting and helpful, please check out the rest of this series on underappreciated diseases and consider subscribing to Strong Medicine for more videos on medicine and medical education.